Welcome everyone to our today's webinar um, about bad practice of green roofs. And um, today we're supported by three companies, um, Rainbird, OptiGrün and Six for Grün. And um, we're really happy that so many of you could join. This just the technical um, information for you. This webinar will be recorded, but um, you're all not visible. So um, that's a good thing for you. And whoever missed out some information, the webinar will be available later on on our website so you can rewatch it. Um, today, the main goal is to share mistakes um, from previous project um, in order to not repeat them again. So our um, speakers, so first of all, I will introduce the EFB and our panelists, our speakers. And um, then we have a presentation about um, several mistakes that can be done on green roofs. And after each of the, of the mistake chapters, um, you will be able to ask questions. Please use the chat window. I will collect the questions there and ask them to our speakers. And then in the end, if there are still some open questions, um, you're welcome to further ask questions in our chat room. Um, so the EFB um, is the European um, Federation of Green Roofs and Wall Associations um, and was founded in 1997 as a nonprofit organization. Um, can you see my slide actually? Okay. Yeah, we can. Uh, is, yes. Is. Okay. It is the umbrella organization um, of green roof and wall associations in Europe. And currently, there are um, 15 national um, associations in the EFB and also collaborating with other networks. Um, um, our um, association is, um, is working um, on the topic to move green uh, to bring green roofs and walls um, more on the table of topics. And especially we're concerned with the quality assurance um, of green roofs and walls. And this is why our um, speakers today will tell you more about their experience. We have Pavel Dostal, who is vice president at DFB, um, uh, board chairman of the Czech Association and also um, has his own company, Greenwill. And furthermore, we have Simon Pernell. He is um, also board member of the EFB, uh, chairman of the Belg Belgium Federation, and also an owner of the Green Building Projects Company. So in, I will hand over now the word to Pavel and Simon, who will yeah, let us know more about uh, mistakes that can be done on green roofs and walls. You, Thank you. So I will just try moving the slides if it works. So when I, now I switched back and forth again. Great, perfect. So uh, hello everybody. Um, we're grateful that we have uh, such a big audience on this uh, topic. Um, what we are actually going to cover today is a really wide range of mistakes that can be made uh, while uh, doing a green roof. Um, we're going to go from the start. So requirements, uh, we're going to uh, see some planning and design mistakes, uh, some installation mistakes as well, and uh, then also bad maintenance. Um, of course, mistakes can arise not only from one uh, of these areas, they can also be a result of a combination of these factors. and. Uh, Usually, the, the, the more complicated uh, issues are a uh, combination. So we're going to uh, start from the requirements. Um, and don't be put off, because we're going to show you really uh, a lot of, a lot of bad, bad practice uh, pictures. But at the end, you, we'll show you also how, how it looks nice uh, when it's done properly. So let's start with the basic requirements uh, not met uh, for a green roof. So you know that one of the 
fundamental requirements for a successful green roof installation is the building structure. Uh, the building structure has to be solid enough to hold uh, the load of the green roof. And as you can see in this case, this uh, wooden construction is really bad designed, uh, maybe badly calculated, and uh, also really badly done. You can see this uh, wooden beams, which are really uh, falling apart, and they are connected only by screws. And this uh, threaded rod on which it all hangs uh, is kind of bending. Uh, underneath all the weight. And that's something we realized after we actually laid the vegetation buildup on the roof. And um, of course, it's not within our capacity to examine every roof uh, structural details uh, like this. Um, but when we, when we installed it, we found out this and all of the roof had to be reconstructed, including the, the structure underneath. Um, this is where it can start, and um, I think Simon can can tell you where it can all lead to uh, when it's not done properly. Hello, everybody. Also, uh, welcome from my behalf. Um, Pavel showed you maybe a, a smaller roof where it can go wrong, but uh, I want to show you some bigger pro a bigger project <clears throat> where we were uh, working on a green roof and uh, where everything also went wrong. This is a, a tennis court in uh, Belgium, near Ghent. Uh, while we were installing, the roof collapsed. Uh, maybe you can go to the next slide, Pavel, please. Uh, so we can see it from on top. And I think this picture marks everything why you should uh, be sure that the roof is strong enough to put a green roof on top. And often we go to uh, clients, private clients mostly, and ask, uh, how strong is your roof? Can the, can the green roof, uh, is it strong enough? And most of the times they come with an answer that's not always very correct or strict. And uh, I hear a lot of times, yes, my, my uncle uh, was here and he weighs 120 kilos and he was on the roof. Nothing happened. So I think the green roof uh, can fit on the roof. So no problem. Um, and obviously, as, as a professional installer, you cannot... Uh, take that um, information for uh, as as enough uh, to 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 be sure that the green roof fits. In this project, um, we had uh, an engineering mistake, so we couldn't really help it. Uh, but uh, you can imagine probably that that it was a very spectacular day when we were working, and luckily the the roof collapsed just in a moment that we were uh, putting more pipes with the substrate truck. So we were on top, but not working. And by that, we saw the roof moving and finally it collapsed. So this roof was, was made to, to bear 120 kilos per square meter. And uh, it collapsed on 70 or 80 kilos per square meter because of an engineering mistake. Um, obviously, such things can always happen. But if you are confronted with projects that you don't know of, um, you better check uh, double with the architect or the contractor if the roof uh, can fit the, the green roof. Maybe you can show the next picture, Pavel. Uh, this is from the inside. So where you see that yeah, the whole metal construction is completely uh, finished. And as Pavel told with his pictures, uh, his rather small roof has need, needed to be completely rebuilt. Uh, this project also had completely to be uh, torn apart and, and be rebuilt. So if you're with a small house, the costs are maybe uh, not too big, but this project costs almost 3 million euros to, uh, to rebuild it. I don't know if the next picture is also from the project. No, okay, we're going to the next subject already. So uh, I think uh, the pictures uh, say enough about construction and how you, uh, how you have to be sure that everything is strong enough. Okay, hey, Pavel, you can uh, continue if you want. Yeah, so this is the one about waterproofing. Can, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so waterproofing and its uh, longevity is another major factor. Of course, when you install a green roof on top of uh, a roof, the waterproofing needs to be uh, in a perfect condition and it needs to be uh, root resistant. Uh, 
So, in the, for example, in the in the middle picture, you can see a PVC membrane which is completely delaminated after uh, years of exposure to to uh, sunlight and bacteria, and obviously, it's not fit to for for a green roof. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, there is clearly um, um, a mistake in the in the layers of the the water membrane, which uh, the layer going from the parapet wall should be always on top, and the, the bottom one uh, should be covered. Uh, maybe, so, uh, yeah, sorry, 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 Pavel. Maybe I can also tell a little bit more because the 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 picture on the left and the right are also PVC membranes, um, and it's something. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about if you should use the PVC membranes for the green roofs because there are softeners in it. And uh, if you put material on the PVC, uh, often the, 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 the softeners are torn out and the PVC membrane gets yeah, uh, hard. It's uh, almost like, uh, like paper. And that was what we had in the, the left and the right picture. Uh, because there was gravel on top and uh, when we removed it to put a new green roof on we discovered that the whole um, membrane was was damaged and almost folded up by because of the the softer the softeners that were torn out of the pvc okay pavel would you like to continue with, with this uh, yeah <laughs> um the, the pictures here, uh, um, often we also have uh, problems with perforations, especially on, on roofs uh, that are still in use. Um, if you, for example, have a roof garden and uh, the roof is on, this, on the floor zero or, or is used as a working space, uh, it's, it's obvious that it's always dangerous to, to keep it exposed a long time uh, long, um, for using uh, other materials and other contractors on top of the roof. And the left picture, uh, maybe you can see the, the little triangle um, hole is, is actually uh, an, uh, a perforation that was made by uh, the guys who are removing the stacker. Um, they throw down the beams and one of the beams got through the roof. Um, and the left picture is the same perforation, uh, probably by uh, um, manipulating materials and using too much pressure on the, on the membrane. Uh, so it got perforated. So perforations are always uh, an issue. And I think um, one of the, the biggest challenges for us to work on a roof and to be sure that, that there is uh, no leak is, uh, is very demanding. Um, obviously, these days, there is a lot of, um, a lot of uh, testing that can be done. We used to have only the water testing, but now you also have the electrical testing. That's, uh, that's a big uh, um, advantage now, uh, but perforations will always be uh, something we have to be very aware of. Yeah, and perforations uh, cannot only happen on existing roofs, but they can happen on a brand new uh, waterproofing as well. So here you can see, uh, again, a PVC membrane underneath which there is um, uh, an OSB uh, board uh, ceiling. And the OSB boards uh, have nails and, and screws sticking out of them. And uh, these nails were not really hammered correctly. And uh, also there were, uh, there were uh, splinters, you know, sticking out of the, the OSB boards. So the, the roofing membrane got perforated, and that was even before the green roof installation. So that's uh, something that uh, is supposed to be right uh, the moment the, the green roof has come on. And uh, with, green, with uh, green roofs, we like to say that they extend the life of waterproofing by uh, at least twice or three times, but when you uh, when the, the lifespan of the waterproofing is zero at the beginning and you extend it twice or three times, it's always zero. You're not really extending it. Uh, you're just making it more complicated to fix the issue. So really waterproofing and its, uh, and its uh, uh, state is a really important precondition for, uh, for a successful green roof installation. 
Here is another example of uh, poorly uh, made waterproofing. In this case, the welding of the seams. Um, now you can see that uh, from the um, in the picture on the right hand side, uh, when I inspected the seam, uh, I had water pouring out of the seam on me, and that was on top of the roof. Uh, I cannot even imagine how full the, the roof structure must have been of water. And the water is supposed to be blocked out by the waterproofing, not, uh, you know, closed by the waterproofing inside of the roof structure. So this is completely wrong. And uh, all of these pictures uh, come from the same project. And there were almost a dozen, uh, dozen uh, mistakes in the waterproofing that we as gardeners discovered before the green roof installation. Ponding, uh, another major thing uh, needs to be sorted out. Uh, ponding creates artificial load on the green roof or on any roof um, because the standing water uh, creates constant pressure, which is not accounted for. And uh, obviously the water needs to flow out of the roof unless it is designed uh, for standing water, which uh, is not the case in these photos. Um, another risk of ponding is that uh, you have small dust uh, and dirt particles gathering in these, uh, in these ponds. And uh, of course that attracts bacteria and bacteria can, uh, can then in time also affect the quality of the waterproofing and lead to its uh, uh, um, doom <laughs> so that's as far as the requirements for green roofs are concerned and that's that's the first chapter that we just finished so uh, before we get on to the design and planning mistakes i would ask elizabeth if there are any questions that we uh, could answer for this part and um, yes actually there was one question in, in the chat um which was what is the electrical test for the water tightness You're gonna answer, Pavel, or do you want me to? I'm, I'm not sure I have the right English words for the electrical uh, tests. Uh, there are at least two types, but I would have to think for a while to, to find the right words. I thought it was electri electrical lights, um, where they put uh, um, some um, sensor underneath the roof, and one on top, and then the water, the, the top one is put under electricity, and the other one also, and if you have a leak, the electricity follows the leak, so they can point out on the roof where the leak is coming from. So it's um, a semi-destructical test because they have to, I thought, make, uh, no, they don't, sorry, it's not a, it's I'm wrong. It's a it's a test where you don't have to make a, a hole in the in the waterproofing um, because the because if they put the sensor underneath on the water underneath the roof, they can automatically follow if they um, uh, scan the roof on top to where the water is running to. So it's quite an interesting test to do. Um, you don't have to put the roof under water for it. Um, you can do it on a sloped roof, for example. You can do it on a, a big roof garden um, where water testing was mostly limited by, by some issues. So it's here in Belgium, uh, I'm sure, is already used quite a lot now for uh, roof gardens. Okay, great. Thank you. Somebody mentioned the term electric field vector mapping. So maybe that was the word you were looking for. Perfect. Let's go on. Um, so uh, leveling the surface with a substrate, is, that's something that we hear about uh, sometimes from the architects. Uh, architects want to have a completely even surface. Um, and that's why they recommend substrate to oh, now it's now it's finally appearing. That's why they want the substrate to level the surface. But it doesn't work like that with a green roof because uh, in the shallow parts, 
you will have lower growing vegetation and in the deeper parts you will have higher growing vegetation and weeds uh, so in effect this will result to a very optically uneven surface where on one part you will have a lush vegetation of weeds and on the other part you will have barely anything so it doesn't really work like that it's, it's not a good idea another thing um, rain shadows um, plants obviously need water to grow and uh, when you put them underneath the roof they will have no water um, they will have only dust collecting on their leaves so which will not be washed away by, by the water and they will not be irrigated so unless uh, there is some special irrigation plants under another roof will not simply grow that's where uh, gravel needs to be put this is a, a picture i put into the slide pavel to um, confirm what you say that uh, even if you have a semi um, uh, or a system that's not even completely closed like this uh, metal wall system it's actually open if you if the if the rain falls through you can you will have water underneath uh, when we were installing this green roof we told the client that they should put gravel there because um, uh, because there would not nothing would grow there because there was no water no rain coming to the to that area and then the architect also told us yeah but you can do it uh, the the metal uh, shield on the on the wall is not is not watertight so the water will fall through but actually as we expected um, a few months uh, later when we were there for maintenance we we saw that you can almost see the alignment of the of the the coverage on top uh, so always when you have this uh, like uh, hanging over a uh, uh, roof you you better use gravel underneath because nothing will grow there yeah and it doesn't just go for roofs it can also go for any technical equipment such as uh, ventilation shafts over uh, the roof and anything which hangs above the the vegetation once it will get no water it will simply not grow and it actually makes sense to follow the pathways of water when designing a green roof. So for example, in this case, the supposed flow of water was from the clouds, then seeping through the, the vegetation buildup, throwing, uh, flowing through the drainage board, and then somehow climbing up to a drainage channel through which it would be drained away from the roof. And obviously, it would not work like that, and it's complete nonsense. Uh, so what would happen would be a, a very nice uh, swamp, and eventually the roof would probably collapse underneath the weight. Maybe a little addition to this detail, Pavel, is that you also have to be aware, because we now had it uh, some weeks ago with a, with a project we've done, uh, where there was uh, used uh, of a reverse roof so the insulation was on top of the membrane and we had one place um, that um, where the contractor made the the the, the hole through the yeah the uh, the hole where the water leaves the roof was on the level of the insulation not on the level of the of the roofing so always be aware that if you use a reverse roof uh, the the exit of the water also has to be on the level of the um, the water the the roof structure and not on the on top of the insulation. Yeah, good point. Yeah, and obviously um, the water is drained uh, to an outlet, and the outlet the outlet should be visible and should be uh, should be surrounded by a gravel strip. It doesn't have to be. As visible as in this picture, uh, this is too much, and even the the gravel strip surrounding the the, the inspection chamber uh, is uh, too narrow. Uh, the whole detail is kind of wrong, but uh, the designer wanted to make it better, and therefore he drew another detail, which was uh, like this. And uh, obviously, I, I cannot imagine the geotextile holding the rounded pebbles in this kind of shape um, 
well, yeah, that's just that's just maybe for amusement. And then we often have this philosophical question of dividing or not dividing uh, uh, the substrate, uh, the part with the vegetation and the, the gravel strip. And here in this case, the designer just thought, I don't know, I'll just do it somehow. So <laughs> he left it open, basically. Can we ask a question in between, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. From the chat, we had a question about the rain and shadow image you showed whether it, it wouldn't be possible to use different plants for the rain and shadow areas, like for the green roof. For the shadow, we always use different plants, but different, uh, if you work a lot on green roofs in the shadow, the, the substrate is gonna have to be a lot thicker also. So uh, I think if you want to work in shadow, you're quickly going to be at uh, 12 centimeters, 10 to 12 centimeters of substrate. And uh, concerning the water, uh, I should say no. It doesn't matter which plants you were going to put underneath. It's it's just completely dry. Um, people of, often um, expect that this water will follow the, the slope of the roof and, and get into this dry zone anyway, but it just doesn't work. Um, every time we tried it, and that's uh, why we also are, are so free to share our, our, our um, prob the problems we had uh, from the past. So nobody in the future has to make the same mistakes again. But we, we often have had this, uh, this problem with um, some kind of cover over the green roof, where we always also thought uh, that it would work. But it just doesn't work. If if there if you have some kind of cover over it, just put in a gravel strip, because uh, the chance is very very slim that something will grow. Um, I can continue with this picture. This is also uh, taken from a project uh, where we were asked to give some advice. Um, it's an old green roof, uh, probably there already for more than fifteen years. Um, supposed to be a, a sedum roof. But the problem is in this project that the roof is almost completely in the shadow. So sunshine is uh, an issue for sure. But when they made this green roof, probably the, the newer systems didn't exist. So they used um, a drainage layer of uh, expanded clay. Uh, on top of that, they put uh, a mineral wool plate and then even more substrate. So this whole system is just too wet for sedum um, and what you get is they get a lot of competition of other plants growing up uh, on the roof so we found some uh, cotton yasters uh, there um, and uh, the problem was when, when we wanted to take them, take them out uh, you also have the problem that the roots were grown into the mineral wool and i know that mineral wool is often um, defined just to hold the rocks uh, hold the roots of the plants in place but this is also one of a problem you get by roots growing into this mineral wool plate because when you do the maintenance and you will you want to uh, get the plants off the roof uh, actually you you uh, uh, you damage the whole system and after a few years you can imagine how this green roof looks like underneath the substrate if this mineral wool is uh, turned out all over the, the whole area. So this can be, there can be a solution for this because the advantage of this uh, system is it's too wet. So probably here, if they should replant the whole roof with shadow plants, uh, because it's so wet, this, this plants would survive. But the budget was limited, so they didn't do it, I think, and we hear nothing from it anymore. But it shows that... Uh, and that you always have to be very careful with the, the layers of the of the green roof and especially in function of which plant you want to put onto the roof. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, another category uh, are pitched roofs. And uh, pitched roofs are, are special and the, there can be numerous mistakes made when installing a pitched roof. For example, in this case, uh, you can see drainage boards uh, lying on the roof and drainage boards obviously have no place on pitched roofs. Uh, 
And the, the another apparent mistake is that they use the uh, uh, soil as the growing media uh, for for the vegetation. And obviously, soil doesn't work in thin layers, uh, and especially not on pitch roofs where it is uh, much more exposed and disconnected from the surrounding uh, profile. So this one is one mistake and this is another mistake uh, and this one might have even been a, a fatal mistake um, because uh, the wooden plank system uh, used for as an anti-slip system for supporting the, uh, the vegetation buildup that's just uh, completely wrong it will sooner or, or later it will slip off the whole roof and i think the guy must have been lucky if he actually survived the installation and was not found under a pile of soil and planks uh, this, is, this is really bad and this one is is bad as well this is an example of uh, um, system which is not uh supported well and um to uh, probably too flexible for the use so it was not able to hold the substrate in place and just uh, slide it off the roof and yet another example of a pitched roof and this time um this is a case where uh, the sedum carpets were not properly secured on the vegetation buildup and started to peel off the roof. And you can see one of the carpets actually uh, caught by the retainer, by the retaining profile on the edge and kind of levitating in the air. And um, it's of course not good for the vegetation buildup and for the, for the uh, roof itself. And it's also dangerous because the sedum carpets weigh quite a lot. And obviously nothing should be falling from the roof. Uh, and uh, the most unfortunate thing uh, about this uh, project is that it is, it is caught on uh, Google, uh, Google Street View uh, and evidenced for <laughs> by, by Google Street View. And if it's just too complicated, uh, you can just completely resign and say, Okay, I'll just make the green roof using plastic plants and will be green. Yeah, that's that's uh, another solution. This is a project from Prague and uh, it's probably too green to be true. So pitched roofs um, basically require a very close cooperation between the installation company and the designer and architect um, because it sometimes it gets into very uh, technical details and uh, the cooperation is necessary so maybe uh, uh, maybe yeah. i can also add some things about the pitched roofs which we discovered as uh, could be problems is that um, if you for example use systems to storage water that are not made of small buckets like uh, some uh, solid uh, drainage boards um, that the water just runs down if you for example use mineral mineral wool plate plates on a green roof on a sloped green green roof the water just goes uh, to the bottom and then you get a uh, underneath you get a whole nice green strip but the rest of the of the green roof probably will be red um, most of the year so we use a lot of um, uh, hard, hard drainage boards with uh, water holding system in it. Um, also use a, a bigger or, or a thicker layer of substrate because it, it dries out more quickly because of the, the gravity. And uh, for sloped green roofs, uh, irrigation can also be uh, a helpful uh, extra to, to, to make sure that in, in, in summer, uh, the roof stays some some kind of green. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to clarify, when I was saying uh, no drainage boards, I meant no, not really. No drainage boards fit for a flat roof on pitched roofs. There are certainly drainage boards which are fit for uh, pit, uh, pitched roofs. 
Okay, let's let's go on. Let's see if we yeah. have some uh, questions. Yeah, we had a question about flat roofs actually. Um, there was the question whether um, uh, some people were saying that they would not install a green roof on a flat roof because they would not have to install also anchors against the wind. If that is possible and um, if there is literature in case it is true or what, what the answer would be. So would you need anchors against the wind on flat roofs if you put green roofs? So I, I can maybe take it on. Um, so there are two kinds of roofs. Uh, or let's say, let's talk about waterproofing. Uh, the waterproofing can either be ballasted by enough ballast. So that means by gravel, by tiles, by a green roof, or it can be anchored. And obviously it has to be calculated. If you ballast a green roof insufficiently by a very lightweight material and it's not anchored, then it may be risky. If you install a, a membrane and you anchor it properly, it can just be there or it can be glued. Or... We are also going to talk about this a little bit further in the presentation where we're going to discuss uh, wind load um, because maybe that's what the question is referring to. If, if, if you have too much uh, wind that the green roof can be blown off, but that's, that comes a little bit further into the presentation. Okay. Do we have any other question, Isabel? Um, I think we can continue and I will collect them for the end. Okay, great. So let's uh, take a look at this example. Uh, I think for those of you who are in the green roof business or construction business, this will uh, this will be uh, quite uh, shocking. This is actually a snapshot of uh, of a website of an installation company, uh, which describes their uh, their installation, how they were trying to achieve a, an even surface uh, of the vegetation together with the parapet walls. And for that reason, they used uh, EPS, polystyrene boards, which they laid directly on PVC waterproofing. And just so that the water had some drainage pathways, they just added some, some uh, distancing plates uh, for the water to uh, seep through the cracks and escape. Um, this is obviously completely wrong, all of it. And uh, the main issue here is the compatibility of the materials. PVC is full of plasticizers and uh, the plasticizers will leach uh, into the polystyrene and the PVC membrane, the main waterproofing will just degrade. Um, and it's, it's not prolonging the lifespan of this roof. It's really shortening it to a few years at maximum. So this is just completely wrong. And not to mention the fact that EPS is not even designed for being soaked uh, with water. That's XPS. Uh, this is just flat out wrong. Uh, so what it surprised me the most is that someone puts it on their website as a, as a reference of good work. Um, this is a, an example from uh, uh, our Slovak colleague, um, Brano. Um, this is, a, this is a, a roof lacking both substrate and a filter sheet. You can see that there is barely anything growing on this roof, uh, barely any sedum. If there is any, it could be one or two species at maximum, because in these conditions, there can grow nothing really. It's just two centimeters, two or three centimeters of substrate, very extreme conditions uh, for the plants. So obviously wrong. And uh, obviously uh, on each roof, there should be outlets and the outlets should be covered by inspection chambers. Uh, in this particular case, you have to dig for the, for the outlets uh, in order to clear it. Um, and this roof was uh, this roof was prepared by a construction company, 
and there was no vegetation put on the roof. So all you can see, all the vegetation you can see is basically uh, as a result of colonization by uh, uh, the plants from the neighborhood. And um, uh, there was even uh, Bodleia growing on this roof. So that's another, another big mistake. And uh, in this case, um, the devil is in details because this is uh, an example of uh, um, kind of a detective work. Um, this green roof uh, borders on um, an exposed bitumen belt. And obviously the bitumen belt is expanding and contracting as it is exposed to the sunlight. Uh, but it doesn't do that underneath the green roof. So um, what happens is that there is a tension between these two areas, the one expanding and the one that is still. And the tension escalated and connected uh, to another issue, which was detailing around this uh, railing pole. And uh, when you put the, the badly made detail together with the tension that was created, you get a gaping hole in the bitumen belt, which was uh, then leaking. Yeah. Um, shall we have some questions here? And there was a question what in inspection chambers are. OK, um, imagine inspection chambers as a box with a lid. And you can open the lid and take a look at the water outlet and maybe clean the water outlet from any uh, excessive vegetation, dirt, um, anything that would block the outlet uh, and prevent it from working. So it's a, it's a box made of aluminum or plastic and yeah, so that the, the outlet can be inspected. There will be pictures following. And also one more question, I think it was concerning the pitched roofs and um, why not having different thicknesses of substrate and different plants? The main thing there is um, that we need to hold the substrate in place. If we are able to hold the substrate in place by some anti-slip system, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't have uh, different thicknesses of substrate. Uh, so absolutely, let's have different thicknesses. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right system to support it. Yeah, it's perfectly possible to have more thickness on a, on a green roof and have more diverse plants on a sloped roof also. It's not a problem. You just have to adjust the, the system, as Pavel says, um, that it can rehold a, a thicker layer of substrate. That's all. Okay, great, perfect. All right, let's, let's go on. So Simon, this is yours. <clears throat> yeah, this is um, a green roof also in Ghent where uh, the contractor called us to, uh, to say that they had a lot of leaks and uh, um, the, the contractor of the green roof who installed it didn't want to uh, come to fix the problem. So, um, they asked us if we can remove the, the whole green roof and, and give advice of what went wrong. And um, actually what we found underneath was quite shocking. It's, um, it's obvious that in the green roofs, um, a lot of contractors uh, don't have it, uh, don't, have, don't detail enough because once you put the substrate on top, nobody will ever see what's underneath until you have a project like this where everything is scooped back off and then you see what's underneath. So this this contractor probably didn't have enough uh, drainage of the same uh, <clears throat> of the same system. So he used combinations, which shouldn't be a problem. It's perfectly possible to use different drainage uh, systems next to each other. But uh, if you don't cover the seams um, with uh, with the filter, uh, you obviously get substrate growing under everything. So it's it blocking the the drainage system um, and it's also really dangerous if you walk on on the roof and there's no protection layer underneath that the sharp uh, lava who's uh, in the substrate can puncture the roof 
the the holes in this roof were probably made by people working on it with uh with planks with nails in it because it had a lot of uh, holes in, in in over the whole area uh but um the 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 lava laying onto the onto the the roof membrane directly is is obviously uh uh quite concerning um also in the left picture you see how how they they finished the details on, onto the um the life anchor uh normally you have to finish this with 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 a filter or with a gravel strip around um here it was done quite sloppy so not a, not a good example of how it should be uh, maybe you can go to the next slide, Pablo. These are some more pictures of the same roof. So uh, we saw actually on the last picture the the fixed drain of Zinco, and here on the right you see the other the other drainage layer that was used. Um, on the right picture you also see that they put two the drainage on another drainage. So probably were too lazy to cut the drainage layer nice and proper next to each other and cover it with the, the filter uh, but they just put it on top and uh, thought it was quite all right um, yeah most of mostly here was was sloppy work uh, not not covering the seams correctly uh, that was what we found underneath so quite shocking this is um, uh, how you uh, picture how you can see that extra water on the green roof actually um, makes that your plants grow better and more nice. So it's uh, you can see this picture as a good picture, but on the other hand, you also uh, can imagine that um, because of these pipes um, uh, exhausting on the um, on the green roof, you get a whole different vegetation uh, area. And here in this roof, uh, on the two left pictures. Um, we had some luck that it was actually the sedum that was that was quite growing good so not too much weed but normally in this situation where, where the the water outlet from a higher roof is on top of the green roof you should put it also in a, in a gravel strip so the water runs underneath the drainage board directly away to the water outlets and you don't have this uh, mixture of extra water coming onto the roof in order to keep the, the vegetation quite similar um the right picture is uh, a green roof where also no filter was used obviously and where the water outlet from the higher roof just dripped into the the substrate of the um, of the green roof underneath and with time the the water just uh, flushed away all the substrate in that area so also this part you should work out in a in a, in a gravel strip or some kind of uh uh, protection uh, system that that the water cannot take away the substrate. And this um, also is a quite a problem in Belgium. We have a lot of um, pre-grown tiles that are used, um, and they are often sold as low-budget systems and also low-weight systems. So they only weigh 50 kilos per square meter, and the problem is they just don't hold enough water. So the upper picture is um, a system that uh, with tiles that just completely dries out. It never gets green. It's always red colored because the, the sedum is completely stressed. Um, so be aware of this kind of systems. You have tiles that are, um, that are quite good and cover enough water, but these lightweight systems um, are often uh, a lot of, they're, they're they just don't look nice. It's always dried out. And the picture in the bottom is um, a green roof. Um, we got into maintenance, uh, not installed by us, but where we discovered that the, sub the substrate was too thin and also there was too much um, expanded clay in it. So the water, the, the substrate mixture itself was just poor, uh, not holding enough water. And obviously, sedum is a very strong plant, but it also needs water to survive. Um, and to withstand the, the extreme um, uh, measures on the on the roof. So also always check the, the quality of the materials you use. Yeah, um, soil instead of substrate, that's, uh, that's a big problem which occurs time and again, and uh, it has multiple uh, layers of, of the 
problem. Um, the main argument against, or the main arguments against uh, uh, soil are that it's not permeable. Uh, it has too many, too many organic particles, so it, it attracts weeds. Um, it's, uh, it has, often it has a large uh, content of clay, which will clog the, the, the water pathways, and the, the drainage systems. And it's just not uh, fit for uh, thin layered systems such as green roofs. So uh, it does not, it seldom works. Uh, yeah, so that's why, um, that's why green roof substrates are here and uh, are proven proven uh, um, uh, choice. Yeah, the picture before from Pavel, you could see the, the dried out um, uh, look of this uh, using soil on a, on a, on a green roof. Um, of course, here in Belgium, we have plenty of rain, so we can show you the pictures uh, that how it's look, how it looks like if you use this soil on a, on a green roof. When it's wet you know you just get ponding with uh, of the water um this this project the contractor actually put a drainage layer underneath but as you can see the the soil just doesn't drain enough to get the water off in time and if you show the next pictures uh pavel you can see that uh, this is not uh something that goes away this is a problem that stays uh for a very long time and uh, probably for uh, for as long as the roof is there, because this picture was taken a few years later, after um, some rain had passed, and you can see the the ponding on the roof is is uh, is quite bad. Um, another another problem with it is is also the load um, of the of the green roof that's um, that's picking up because of the water staying onto the roof. I see a black screen now. Did you move to the next picture, Pavel? Or yeah, no, moved to the next one. Um, it's the one with the broken pipe underneath the. Okay, that's. Uh, can you still see it? Or yes. Yeah. Okay, um, that that uh, the pictures of the broken pipe um, or another project where uh, our advice was asked by the developer because they had some contractor obviously not used of putting green roofs on on the on the cellar um and uh, it's actually um a, a car parking underneath uh so they just uh, they in this situation they even didn't use a drainage layer they just put the soil normal soil on a on the epdm so you don't have any capacity of draining um you can you can go to the next picture uh, pavel if you want um also uh, resulting in a quite catastrophic uh, situation where the water was um, immensely high almost a uh, whole uh, autumn and and spring uh, because we had quite a lot of rain that time so you can see that uh, that the, the the water just stays there also underneath the the paving um the paving the terraces uh, they just put the 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 uh, we call it stabilize. I don't know how we call it in uh, other countries, <laughs> uh, where they put the, the paving on, where the cement is in. There is put directly on the EPDM, also possibly affecting the the EPDM because of the chemicals that are, that, are, that are in. Um, as you can see here, the water is so high that that it just crawls into the wall. And if you show the next picture, uh, Pavel, there we go to the cellar where it just was the like the. The water was pouring in uh, in every hole possible, every connection with the wall and the and the ceiling. Everywhere you had this water coming in was it is quite a a big uh, lawsuit, I think, for the moment. Um, but obviously, still today, um, in a country like with us in Belgium, where we have a lot of experience already in green roofs, uh, it's unbelievable. This kind of um, problems can still uh, happen and and. People are still working like this. This is uh, pictures of a green roof uh, near the coast, as you can see, um, where obviously you have a lot of wind and um, it's uh, very important to, to uh, bear that in mind and to use the, the right systems 
to uh, make sure that that the when it storms the the wind doesn't pick up the green roof and, and tears it all apart and that was exactly what was happening here uh um, in case of a uh, wind and storm um the they just it just sucked out the, the substrate first and then uh later the mineral wool plates and uh, the geotextile uh, we afterwards finished it up with uh, another system um without the mineral wool just substrate and we also used the the special um, sedum blankets and since then there were no problems anymore with this uh, situation yeah um, gravel strips uh, are also something that we uh, quite a lot debate about with architects uh, some architects uh, like gravel because it creates a nice frame around the green roof but some don't uh, because they want to have uh, the vegetation everywhere, just like on those uh, visuals um, that they uh, uh, create for the customer. Um, but when you don't have the gravel strips in places where they are uh, necessary, such as high wind load areas around the the perimeter of the of the green roof or behind the parapet walls, uh, this can happen. So basically, you will have uh, the substrate flying away obviously no plants growing there and then uh, the layers will be flapping against your uh, roof and eventually uh, the wind will get onto the waterproofing and um, you will have a problem so that's fa as far as the as the installation is concerned and before the the final uh, chapter let's uh, let's just ask uh, Isabel if there are any questions Yes, I, I would ask one question for now and then keep others for the end. And this, the one I wanted to ask is, um, what about totally inorganic substrate with third irrigation? For which plants? It's everything depends on plants. So uh, if you have a totally inorganic substrate, I think the most you can expect is some uh really dry loving uh plants well basically sedum and other succulents uh maybe opuntia um cactus um uh, yeah some other really extreme conditions loving plants it's obvious that plants need organic matter and probably they mean that you have to irrigate with uh, some fertilizer in it like you go uh, ahead with the uh, green wall systems but i think if you don't have uh, any organic material in the substrate you also have the risk that this quite mineral substrate is um, uh, more likely to be blown away by the wind because the organic matter just also clings it a little bit together I should not test with it, but uh, I don't know. It's a strange question. I don't think uh, it's uh, it's a good idea, but maybe somebody can check it out. <laughs> what happens? See what happened. Yeah, if it works, let us know. Yeah, or otherwise we have mm -hmm. more pictures for the next time we do this presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, any more questions? I think we, we continue and, and I'll keep questions for later on. Okay. Maintenance. Um, every green roof requires maintenance and every roof in general requires maintenance. Um, some people say, I oh, will just have gravel on my roof and uh, that's a no maintenance roof. It's not. Uh, this is an inverted uh, roof. Uh, so XPS. Um, then uh, uh, protection sheet and then gravel and uh, when you don't maintain it you will just have trees growing there bushes uh, all the other plants that just yeah it's there is no no maintenance roof not even not even a pure uh, membrane roof everything requires maintenance um with uh, regards to maintenance, uh, the crucial period is after you set up the vegetation, the establishment stage. Uh, when there is no irrigation in the establishment stage, which follows after the green roof installation, uh, the plants 
will just not you know take up it's uh, uh as clear you will have um, very few species there and uh, the the plant growth will be impeded by a couple of years at least so uh, um every every green roof needs to be needs to be taken care of after the establishment and needs to be watered with regards to the plants extensive roofs can take three weeks to to water and uh, up to the conditions of course and uh intensive need, need constant care this is also regarding the gravel strips um always uh, an, an, an interesting subject from some discussion with uh, architects and uh, designers um I'm really fond of just putting the, the gravel strips where they need to be um, because, as you can see on this picture, this uh, the sedum plants, they just grow into the gravel. And uh, every year you have to take all the plants back out to um, make the gravel strips work. So uh, the more gravel you put, the, the more work you have in maintenance. And uh, I'm uh, absolutely convinced that gravel strips are necessary in some situations. But um, I'm uh, really pro of avoiding uh, too much gravel strips um, because they just also take a lot of maintenance every year. And uh, after all, they, they, they all just get covered by the sedum also. Yeah, another um, maintenance uh, issue, and this is often, it's basically the basic uh, thing that needs to be done during any maintenance is cleaning the uh, outlets, uh, cleaning the inspection chambers, because um, obviously plants follow the water and so most of the water is around these inspection chambers. Um, so plants uh, love it there, even though it's, it's covered by a lid. Um, so uh, the outlets need to be regularly uh, maintained once or twice a year. These are some uh, examples of um, outlets that got clogged. Um, the picture on the right on top is actually um, a problem with the installation where they just didn't have enough um, um attention for for detailing so they they let the pe foil uh, or the water uh, the roots resistant foil they just didn't cut it away uh, and the outlet so it it got uh, uh, clogged by that and um, the left picture is actually a roof where the um, designer um, asked us to put gravel around the outlets so around the um, inspection chambers I'm not a fan of that because what happened on that roof, it was a quite a special situation. This roof was um, not very high and um, also in, an, in, a, in a neighborhood where there's a lot of children and they, this, this roof is 700 square meters. So uh, because they lacked uh, space to place, they, they got onto the roof. And uh, of course, they found it very interesting to... Uh, take out this uh, inspection chambers and because of the gravel that was around the inspection chambers which didn't have any use at all because the the water is already on the, underneath the drainage board when it gets to the inspection chamber but because of the gravel being around the inspection chamber all this gravel um, fell into the uh, outlet and it got blocked completely so to get this empty it's it's uh, it's it takes a lot of more effort than if you, for example, just would have uh, substrate falling into this uh, outlet because with the a high pressure um, water hose, you can you can just uh, spray the, the, the substrate through. But with this rock, obviously, it's not possible. And the picture in the right uh, corner underneath is obviously uh, a roof where just uh, no maintenance was was held. And um, because of wind uh, and, and, and all that, you get um material getting stuck in especially in the corners and and obviously also in the in the areas where where it's more it's where the the, the outlets are because it's lower and they get stuck there so the the whole outlet uh, get, got blocked uh, uh because there was no maintenance on this green roof also the weeding is um is um something 
you have to always bear in mind you, you have to take away all this uh, small trees uh, for sure because they are the plants that can do your um, uh, waterproofing harm it's not the plants we put on the roof it's most of the times the the invasive plants that that get on top that uh, that can be a problem for your waterproofing so always be sure that uh, the all the small shrubs and trees are taken uh, out and so the so they don't get time to grow because their their roots can be more um, devastating for the for the green roof than uh, the plants that are, are growing on top Yeah, and weeding um, is especially important if you have uh, uh, solar panels on your green roof. Um, um, in the left picture, uh, the green roof was there first, and then the owner decided to cover it, uh, use it better uh, with uh, solar panels. And obviously, I, I wonder if he actually benefited from this choice, because what happened was that the plants so desperately wanted to reach the sunlight that they grew through the little holes uh, between the panels to reach the sunlight and of course overshadow the panels and decrease their efficiency. And they would be even more uh, even more uh, prompted because they were you know, donated by water uh, flowing from the panels uh, on the plants. Uh, so they had, uh, they had a special irrigation even. And uh, how do you want to maintain such a roof? It's it's impossible to climb underneath the panels to weed it out, and trimming the vegetation on the level of the panels will do actually no um, uh, no good uh, work. Um, yeah, so th there are special there are special systems for combining green roofs with uh, solar panels, and the systems are elevated above the surface of the vegetation so that they minimize the risk of overshadowing uh, by the plants. I don't know if Simon wants to add anything to, to this one. Yeah, well, it's it's the right picture is quite the same. It's a project where we were asked to do the maintenance because the solar panels obviously got uh, uh, some shadow uh, because of all the plants growing there. And um, yeah, maybe in this situation, um, I think the the right system was used uh, to put the solar panels there. But I think it was uh, it would have been a good idea to put a gravel strip. Uh, for like 30 centimeters in front of the panels or uh, do uh, more often uh, maintenance on this roof so the plants uh, stay low. Yeah. And uh, after seeing all these pictures, you may be wondering if, uh, if it even can be done right. And it can. Uh, and in most cases, it is, uh, fortunately. Um, and you can rely on a lot of uh, quality and expert materials, such as standards, norms, and guidelines in many uh, countries. Um, so uh, here is a list of the most uh, most uh, quoted, most known. Uh, but of course, uh, in many other countries, uh, you have their own guidelines and standards which reflect the local conditions uh, and uh, you can have a different guideline in, uh, in Italy uh, for the south and uh, something better uh, for the northern part, for example. So it's also important to take in, into consideration the location uh, that you are doing the green roof in. Um, there are also training and qualification courses uh, some of them are even free of charge. You can find a list of all these courses on the EFB website. So efb-greenroof.eu. Uh, um, um, and uh, much, of, much of the know-how uh, can be actually gained in these courses. Um, yep. And... Uh, you can also rely on uh, the members uh, of the national associations of the uh, EFB, uh, which are mostly expert companies focusing on the installation of uh, green roofs. And they have a very good access to all the training and qualification courses. Uh, so it's a good idea 
to uh, to uh, if you're not uh, in any uh, such association to join your uh, local uh, national association. So to conclude, um, it's important to always check the construction as much as you can, basically, to make sure that it can actually hold a, a green roof. Uh, it can be difficult, but uh, it needs to be even attempted. Um, waterproofing is crucial. Plants follow the water. If there is a leak, it's likely that plants will go there as well. Um, so waterproofing needs to be watertight and needs to be perfect and needs to be checked. Um, also, it's important to check the people you work with uh, so that they do the right work and uh, that they don't um, do any harm. Um, it's important to plan all the way. So from the start, from the very visual of the architect, if it's even possible to green, green up the construction as he envisages it, uh, or if if it's if there is a glitch, um, and also if we plan for something, we need to know how we are going to keep it up there. So we need to plan for the maintenance as well. So planning from the start all the way, and uh, because green roofs are a multidisciplinary uh, field, uh, it's important to engage uh, the experts in the field. So. Uh, people who understand plants, gardeners, landscapers, landscape architects, uh, also people who understand uh, construction, so waterproofers, engineers, and all the other related fields. And if you do it right, it can look like this roof of Simon. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, we just go through the pictures, Pavel, because we're already yes. spending our time. So let let just let the speaker the, the the picture speak for itself. <laughs> and maybe we can um, ask some questions in the meantime, and um, that popped up. Um, so one question that came earlier was that you mentioned that self-colonized roofs are inherently bad, um, but. Um, brown roofs become very trendy. So what is what is your opinion on that? They don't have to be a bad thing. Brown roofs are quite interesting. Um, you just have to be uh, careful that the plants are growing on it uh, cannot do cannot do any harm to the to the waterproofing. So I'm uh, for sure not against brown roofs, not at all. And uh, it can be quite interesting to to let nature do its work. Uh, actually, we have this big roof on um, uh, at Zwen in uh, Knokke in Belgium. It's a natural. Uh, it's a, a nature uh, park. And actually, the pictures you saw with the green frog, uh, green tree frogs, uh, is taken there. And this roof was um, in first hand planted with. Um, um some uh, grasses but now nature takes over and we um we agreed with the with the, the owners that we can let this uh, roof be colonized by plants that are growing there and just keep it under control with uh, regular maintenance so i think two or three times a year we just uh, make sure that that no plants get too um aggressive that there are no aggressive plants on the roof and no, not one species gets uh, gets the upper hand. So that's a little bit. I, we call it selective weeding. You know, uh, take some plants out to to make the diversity uh, big enough. But it's it's perfectly possible, and I think it's one of the most interesting approaches of a green roof to let nature um, take over. Yeah, one thing to bear in mind there, I would add, would be that. Uh, Often the plants which are able to colonize uh, the environments are very hardy and uh, can survive in very harsh environments. Uh, for example, birch, um, it can even grow from, from a wall and just like that, it can grow from a green roof and uh, it can pose a risk to the waterproofing. So um, if you want to go that path, you, I would say would have to have experts on your side to
to distinguish which plants are actually good and pose no risk to the building and which plants are better uh, better out exactly okay um, um, one question was where the um, green roof with the frog is is located. It was it's in uh, uh, Zwen Zwen Knokke. It's in Belgium near the coast. It's a famous uh, nature um, resort, and um, it's uh, we when we did the maintenance this year. Um, the, the because of Corona, we got there quite late this year, so a lot of. Um, uh, plants were growing quite wild and uh, when they started with the maintenance uh, they noticed that there were a lot of tree frogs which are quite uh, they only live in some places um, in Belgium but uh, obviously uh, on the roof there they felt quite safe and there were a lot of them so it was uh, a nice encounter and uh, I think uh, um, a good evidence of, of, of a healthy roof that there is a uh, great biodiversity on top. Mm -hmm. um, another question was um, what the, the substrate, the substrate is um, for intensive roofs when trees or shrubs are used. Okay, uh, generally uh, substrate is a mixture of materials. It can be a mixture of materials which can be extracted from the earth or it can be uh, some waste materials uh, such as uh, expanded clay or uh, brick, crushed brick, or materials such uh, like this. Uh, for uh, intensive roofs, um, it's important to have more organic content in the substrate. The organic content can be uh, can be um, made by, um, for example. Uh, compost or um, uh, I forgot peat. Yeah, uh, can I, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah. So basically, the more um, intensive plants, the more organic content you will need. But up to a certain point, because uh, you know you want the substrate to be stable uh in long term so that the plants do not just you know devour all of the organic content and uh yeah and, and that would mean that you would lose the the substrate there um so uh and also the, the organic content can you know can be um if it's if it's not the right uh if it's not made the right way it can also wash away from the roof and that can impair the quality of the of the runoff water uh so it's it's good to uh check the standards for substrates or the norms and all the important parameters of these uh substances of these materials are uh specified in these standards and norms and often the substrate producers uh, certify that it's according to these uh, norms. Thank you. Uh, the next question was: um, Are there any requirements for in installation of a roof of a system for safety maintenance on a flat roof on high buildings? Yeah, I think so. It, it's, it depends, um, but here in Belgium, uh, obviously. Um, Every roof that that has a green roof almost is um, um, designed with with some some system where you can make an anchor uh, to to do the maintenance of the green roof. So I think it's quite uh, obvious that if you put a green roof on top, you have to make sure that the installers or the the people who do the maintenance can do this uh, quite safe. So I I would really suggest to to do to do that. Okay. Um, was the question of if there was a system that where that you can use to combine green roof with um, safety systems or yeah, of a safety system for maintenance. I think I think there are maybe Pavel knows for sure, but I think there are systems where the green roof is used as a counterweight to uh, um, if somebody falls off. 
that the green roof itself is a counterweight, but I don't know for sure. I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. Um, yeah, so, so I don't. We really... still have m plenty others, so I will. <laughs> I will continue with another one. Um, is there any idea how to install green roofs on pitched roofs covered by metal sheets? Ah, I would rather not go that path. As metal needs to breathe, and if you don't want to, <laughs> if you don't want to just reconstruct it in a few years, don't do it. No, don't do it. Not on a metal roof, pitched or or flat, doesn't matter. Metal roofs are not made to uh, be green. Okay, and then there was a question about a picture you showed um, with the non uh, non um roofs in the beginning with um, pink flowers, I think. Mm -hmm. And what plants were these? Let's Let try know. to go back. This one. Um, I'm not sure. They said the beginning of it's this. The, it's the beginning. Yeah. Um. The mo most of them are uh, onions. Um, the anthos. Yeah, the anthos. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, they are actually pre-grown mats um, that were fabricated by uh, Samper Green, the sedum herb mats. So uh, they had a, a quite a good result on this roof with them. And I think a good question to conclude is. Um, whether lightweight industrial buildings cannot get a green roof. They can, but I don't think you should have the same expectations uh, on aesthetical value as the pictures, for example, you saw uh, in the last slides. Uh, but for sure, um, there are low weight systems on the market that can be used. Um, but I... I'm not always a fan of them, and uh, but you you, should, you could say any green roof is better than no green roof. So um, although this is maybe a dangerous uh, <laughs> thing to say, uh, but it's for sure it's it's possible to put it on a lightweight um, metal construction or industrial building. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it might not be that difficult. Um... I think it's only a matter of how you design the roof structure. If you design it so that it has enough load bearing capacity and it can hold a green roof, it can even hold a really nice biodiverse or if you design it for intensive, it can hold intensive. Um, but often only or mostly ex uh, extensive green roofs are on, on industrial parks because they are lightweight. And uh, the distances between the, you know, the columns and uh, the supporting beams are uh, larger because of the use of the building. So yeah, the, it's it's uh, in terms of structural engineering, it's easier uh, to uh, plan for a lightweight uh, lightweight uh, vegetation buildup. And if you would like to give it a little extra, irrigation can also help. So with irrigation, you can always do this little extra where so that plants who otherwise shouldn't survive the dry uh, conditions can still survive. So with that extra, you maybe can make a nicer green roof of a lightweight uh, green roof system. Okay, thank you. So I think we will ask the last questions. And if there are more questions that come up, you are always welcome to um, contact the EFP office and we're happy to help. So the last question is, if there's any experience of air retention in the roofs that, and if that is a problem in dry countries. Air retention? Yes. Maybe question they mean- from Spain. <laughs> the only thing I can think of is, um, for example, in, um, systems with a very thick drainage board where the buckets are normally filled with water and in summer they dry out. Um, that's the only thing I can uh, think of what they mean here. And uh, obviously that's 
this is not a good thing because the roots of the plants also um, hang into these empty empty boxes and if they're not filled with water it can be a problem so that the plants dry out from underneath yeah and it's uh, especially uh, especially bad for herbs and higher plants um, yeah. okay great i think all the questions that still come up please just um, contact the efb um, and you can also follow us on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and contact us for any questions. Um, thanks again to our sponsors um, that supported uh, this webinar. Um, we will have an, a following webinar um, about the topic of green roof policies. Um, the date still needs to be fixed, but stay tuned um, on our website. So thank you for everyone who joined and thanks to our speakers. I think it was a really interesting presentation.